Imagination is everything. It's the preview to life's coming attraction. This is important information. And think about, because tomorrow's the first day of the rest of our lives. So what an opportunity we have to practice what he preached. Because it's actually a scripture, but it's a scripture that's never explained to you the right way. When I learned it, it changed my life. That's a scripture that you've all heard. It says faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. All faith is really, the substance of it is just what you hope for. That's all faith is. It's just real hard hoping. You know when you was little and you said, I hope I get a bike for Christmas and you went out there one year and the bike was under the tree. You remember when you said you hope you graduate and you mess around and got a diploma. Then you remember when you said you hope you get a job and you mess around and you got a job. At one point in time, the older you get, this got to start clicking in. That faith is really the substance of things hoped for. That if you hope hard enough, one day you ought to get smart and turn all that hoping into belief. And what is belief? Nothing but faith. And what is faith? Faith is belief in things that you cannot see. When you ain't seen no way you was going to get a job, got you one, didn't you? When you ain't seen no way you was going to get that bike, he got you one, didn't you? When you ain't think you was going to graduate, you graduated, didn't you? That's because God was turning your hopes into faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. But, you know, faith without works is nothing. So try to be an agent for good. Hit a kicker. This is the part you got to get. And the evidence of things not seen. Remember I told you that imagination is everything? It's the preview to life's coming attraction. But let me tell you the problem with your imagination. Problem with your imagination is you tell it to the wrong people. You want to kill a big dream, tell it to a small-minded person. Do you know how many times God has showed you something? in your imagination that you knew was just for you. You were so excited when he came to you, you went and you shared it with your family and friends. You know what they did? They shot it down. You know why they shot it down? Because they couldn't see it. You know why they couldn't see it? Because God didn't show it to them. He showed it to you. He showed you the evidence of things not seen. See, they might love you, but they don't know what God going to do for you. See, your mama and them, your cousin and them, your friends, they don't know. See, you got to be careful when you share your imagination with small-minded people. Nobody else can see your imagination but you. But see, it ain't just you imagining stuff. It's your God showing you a preview of a coming attraction that he has for you. God loves you right where you at. All of you, you're in the process right now. You're in the process of becoming what God wants you to be. See, the reason you wake up every day is because God ain't through with you yet. Because he still has something for you that you've yet to receive. But you have to start living your life in expectation. You have got to start expecting great things to happen for you in order for it to happen. It is the law of attraction. It is real. It is nothing fake about it. A man is as he thinking. If you live your life in expectations, that's what happens to you. If you live your life in despair, that's what happens to you. If you say all men are dogs, you're going to meet every last one of them. I'll never be rich. You won't. You won't. The moment you change the frequency that your tower emits, the moment you change that frequency, different things come back to you. I'm telling you this how it works. If you change your attitude, 
you change your altitude. Change your attitude, you change your altitude. I'm going to tell you something that every successful person has to do, including you. Believe it or not, every successful person in this world has jumped. I'm going to tell you what I mean by that. You eventually, you are going to have to jump. You cannot just exist in this life. You have got to try to live. If you are waking up thinking that there's got to be more to your life than it is, man, believe that it is. Believe in your heart of hearts that it is. But to get to that life, you're going to have to jump. And I'll tell you why I call it jumping. When you see people in life, when you're standing on the cliff of life and you see people soaring by, and you see people soaring, going to exotic places, you hear about them doing wonderful things. Maybe you look up the street and your neighbor just gets a car every year and every two years. You know, how is he doing that? Have you ever thought, maybe this person right here has identified their gift and is living in their gift? You just got to quit looking at gifts as run and jump and sing and dance. It's more than that. It's if you know how to network, if you can connect dots, if you draw, if you teach. Some of y'all fry chicken better than anybody else. Bake pie. Some of you cut hair, color hair. Your gift, not your education. You go get an education, that's nice. But if you don't use your gift, that education only going to take you so far. I know a lot of people got degrees, man. They ain't even using it. It's your gift. But the only way for you to soar is you got to jump. You got to take that gift that's packed away on your back. You got to jump off that cliff and pull that cord. That gift opens up and provides the soar. If you don't ever use it, you're going to just go to work. And if you're getting up going to work on a job every day that you hate going to, that ain't living, man. You just existed. At one point in time, you ought to see what living is like. But the only way to see what living is like, you got to jump. And here the problem. Let me just be real with you. When you first jump, let me tell you something. Your parachute will not open right away. When you jump, it's not going to open right away. You're going to hit them rocks. You're going to get some skin tore off on them cliffs. You're going to get all your clothes tore off. You're going to get some cuts on you. You're going to be bleeding pretty bad. But eventually, eventually, the parachute has to open. That ain't a theory. That's a promise. Here's another thing. You can play it safe and deal without the cuts and the tags. And you can stand on that cliff of life forever soon. But if you don't jump, I got another promise I can make. Your parachute will never open. You'll never know. If I were you, I would jump. Because that's the only way to get to that abundant life. You got to jump, man. You got to take a chance. Now, when I get through talking, there are those of you who have discussed this in the car. Well, I got bills. Whether you stay on the cliff or you jump, you're going to have bills. Well, if I quit my job, I'm going to ruin my credit. If you got a job, you live in check to check. Even if you got A1 credit, you can't buy nothing else no damn way. At one point in time, man, do yourself a favor. Before you leave this world, before you die, jump. Just jump one time. Just jump. Thank you very much. Now, Albert Einstein had a quote. He said, imagination is everything. It's the preview to life's coming attractions. This is important information. The biggest thing that always troubled me was my imagination. Because it was so big when I was a kid. You know, I grew up poor, but I was always imagining stuff. You know, my mama, once a month, would buy a travel magazine at the grocery store. My father used to be so pissed off. Bill, why are we spending this money? We ain't, cause we were poor. 
She said, Slick, we ain't got no money to take this boy nowhere. But if he can look in these magazines, maybe one day, it'll, it'll, it'll cause him to want to travel. I've been to so many countries around the world because of that magazine. I just wanted to go see stuff. My mama had enough sense to plant that seed. In. It's like at Christmas time, we used to get in the car. My daddy used to take us to the suburbs so we could see the lights. And you know, we just drove around the lights. I, could, I was amazed at the suburbs because I would see these big houses with horseshoe driveways where you drove in and came out the other side. And so I told my daddy one time he was riding, I said, Daddy, why don't we get one of them houses? He said, boy, I ain't got no money for that. That's what I'm bringing you out here for. She said, one day you'll be able to get one of them houses. Let me explain something to you. Because of that right there, I've probably had in my lifetime now about 11 homes. I got four now in different states. Every house I own got a horseshoe drive. Baby. When they was living, they told me one time, they were sitting up watching TV. My daddy looked at my mama and said, Bill, he called my mama Bill and said, can you believe that this little boy we had on TV? She said, Slick, I can't believe this. I used to send my daddy $5,000 a week. You know, when I first got on TV, I was making $55,000 a week, so I sent my mama him $5,000 a week. When I got into Kings of Comedy, my father was still living. I showed my daddy one time how much money I made. He said, boy, it take me four years to make this kind of money. So I was able to give them something with my life. So before my mom and them left this world, I could give them something. I bought them everything, man, houses, cars, furniture. I bought them everything I could think. Try. And you know what's crazy, man? I'm 62 years old. I still want them. Be proud of me. I'm still hoping that they in heaven watching me. And they see me turn into something. That's all I ever wanted. It was in my imagination to take care of them. You just got to believe that. You just got to believe, man. Don't ever give up. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. All faith is, really, the substance of it is just what you hope for. That's all faith is. It's just real hard hoping. You remember when you was little and you said, I hope I get a bike for Christmas? And you went out there one year and a bike was under the tree? You remember when you said you hope you graduate and you mess around and got a diploma? Then you remember when you said you hope you get a job and you mess around and you got a job? Huh? At one point in time, the older you get, this got to start clicking in. That faith is really the substance of things hoped for. That if you hope hard enough, one day you ought to get smart and turn all that hoping into belief. And what is belief? Nothing but faith. And what is faith? Faith is belief in things that you cannot see. See, this what the part you gotta get. The evidence of things not seen. Remember I told you that imagination is everything? It's the preview to life's coming attraction. Man, do you know, but do you, Lord, now let me tell you the problem with your imagination. The problem with your imagination is you tell it to the wrong people. If you want to kill a big dream, tell it to a small-minded person. You wouldn't, you shared it with your family and friends. You know what they did? They shot it down. You know why they shot it down? Because they couldn't see it. See, your mom and them, your cousin and them, your friends, they don't know. See, you got to be careful when you share your imagination with small-minded people. Nobody else can see your imagination but you. Your gift is very simple to know. You don't have to go anywhere to discover it. It's not in the water, it's not on the mountaintop, it ain't hid under a rock. Now this is how you know you're not living in your gift. If when the alarm clock goes off in the morning and you ain't happy about it, you ain't doing what you want to do.
If your job makes you sick to go to, if you're unhappy with waking up to go to where you got to go, it's because you ain't living in your gift. What burns in your heart is important for you to pay attention to because it never goes away. That's why people wake up in a rut. See, you hate waking up because you're waking up and you don't know the reason. You're waking up and you don't have no design in mind. Once you live in your purpose, when you discover your gift, you can't wait to wake up. Please understand, pay very close attention to the thing that makes you happy. All of you are gifted at something. The problem is, you keep wanting your gift to be what somebody else's gift is. Identify your own gift because you already have it. Here's the way you identify your gift. Your gift is the thing that you do the absolute best with the least amount of effort. If you fry chicken better than everybody you know, you ought to be somewhere frying chicken. People make millions of dollars frying chicken. Popeyes, Kentucky Fried Chicken, El Pollo Loco. All they doing is making chicken. They just found a way to do it. Somebody just started making chicken. You know the story of Marie Callender's? Do you know what this woman did, man? She worked for a diner, a greasy spoon diner that was going out of business. It was her only job. She was a single mother. It was her only job. She needed that job, but the diner was going to close. So she went to the owner of the diner and said, let me bake one of my pies. People like my pies and see if I can help you make a little money. He said, whatever, bring it in. He, she bought one pie in. They sold every slice. The next day, the people came in and asked for the pie. She had to go home and make another pie. The next day, so many people asked for the pie, she had to make four pies. Then people start saying, can I buy my own pie? She made so many pies at this store that she eventually saved her money and put a commercial oven in her house. Now all, she done made so many pies, the dude's shop, he ain't selling hamburger no more. All he's selling is them damn pies. That's how Marie Callender got started. Marie Callender now has over 120 restaurants. You can't go to no frozen food section without seeing Marie Callender in there. You know what she started with? A pie. One pie. Your gift will make room for you. Now what is your gift? It's the thing that you do the absolute best with the least amount of effort. That's your gift. Quit running away from the gift. Your gift will make room for you. Stop trying to be something you ain't gifted at. Maybe you here because you need to hear this. Here. Maybe you here because you need to dust off your dreams. Maybe you need to explore your imagination. Maybe you just need to identify your gift so you can get so you can quit tripping in your own life trying to figure out what you can do. Some people are born to be teachers, caregivers, nurses babysitters. Those are gifts, you know what I mean? If you're living in your gift, you're cool. It's just if you ain't. You do anything else, when that alarm clock go off in the morning, you ain't gonna like it. And I would hate to die and never do the thing I was born to do. You should look into that before you mess around and check out of here. I was miserable in my life. I didn't like waking up. I ain't have no purpose. I ain't know what I was supposed to be doing. On October 8th, 1985, I walked in a comedy club for the first time. Signed up for the following week. The following week, a girl took me down there. She said, you got to go to comedy club. You're the funniest person I've ever met. I never even heard of comedy clubs. I'm 27. I walked in the comedy club. I signed up for the following week. I'm going to sit here and learn. I knew I was funny. I just didn't know what to do with it. They had 10 acts go up. Nine of them went up. I didn't laugh at one joke. I was just sitting there just, man, I wish that was me. Man, they should have said this. Every joke they told, I knew the punchline before they said it, and I wrote a better punchline in my mind what they should have said. It got to guy number 10, they called his name, he wasn't there. They said, well, he's not here, we're gonna go to next week's list. Steve Harvey, where are you? Long story short, I won amateur night that night. I won $50. It was a 45-minute drive to my house with this girl named Gladys. I cried 45 minutes. She said, what you crying for? It ain't but $50. I said, no, no, you don't even understand. 
I, I was born tonight. I now know what I'm supposed to do. I went to work the next day, October 9th, and quit my job. With $50, I had nothing. I just never gave up. I'm gonna tell you something. That decision cost me everything I had. I, I lost everything. I lost my family. I lost friends. I lost everything. I became homeless. I lived in a car for three years. But I just saw this. I saw this. I saw this vision. I just pursued it. I said, wow, that's it. You have to take chances in life. Life is about risk. If you play it safe in life, you ain't gonna have much of a life. If you play it safe, you won't have much of a life. Life is risk. It take, it take courage to pursue your dream. Now it's gonna cost you something. Most people are not willing to pay what it costs to go after your dream, cause you're gonna have to hurt a little bit. And most people don't like being uncomfortable. If you don't wanna be uncomfortable, please do not pursue success. Because success is a very uncomfortable feeling. And I just learned to be, I learned to be comfortable being uncomfortable. Life is hard. See, for every time you have a plan, a dream, an aspiration, or a goal, do you know what happens every time you have one of those? This thing comes along called life. It happens to everybody. Life has disappointments, it's got peaks and valleys. You're gonna lose somebody you care about one day. That's a valley. Somebody gonna close the plant you thought was gonna stay open so you can retire, that's a valley. Somebody gonna fire you for an unjust cause, that's a valley. The people that got your credit card gonna sell their company, gonna sell their business to another credit card company, your 18% go up to 26%, you don't even know why now, your minimum didn't change, cause you had, cause it's life. You can stop thinking that life fitting to be easy, cause I got news for you, it ain't. That's a false hope to think you're gonna have a, a, a wonderfully carefree life. That's unthinkable. We all live in this bubble. What you gotta do, you gotta put more air in your bubble. You got to blow your bubble up. Expand yourself. Take yourself out your comfort zone. Do not live in your bubble. Put some more air in your bubble. If you stay in your comfort zone, that's where you will fail. You will fail in your comfort zone. Success is not a comfortable procedure. It is a very uncomfortable thing to attempt. So you gotta get comfortable being uncomfortable if you ever wanna be successful. Start putting some pressure on. Put some pressure on yourself. Get out here and get about it. Look, I love to sugarcoat this thing for you. I love to tell you, look, you can go out here and get rich, do a couple of things, they ain't, they ain't happen. You gotta get real doggish. You gotta get downright funky if you wanna make it. Now, like I was telling you before, if you wanna be ordinary, you ain't even gotta listen to me. Just go on about your business. If you think ordinary is cool, ain't no problem. It's some really, really wonderful ordinary people. But if you are sitting in this room and you have extraordinary aspirations, then you're gonna have to do extra. You put extra on top of ordinary and you come up with extraordinary. It's no other way. I'm sorry, but here's the fact. All of you have extraordinary capabilities, all of you. You have to decide if you are willing to do the things to put you in that category. It's a suggestion to all young people, if you could just hear me clearly, don't do what I did. Most people I know mess off all of their twenties. From twenty to twenty-nine, they just jack it off. They just jack off their twenties. They mess them up. Because twenty is that age, man, where you just really just trying to have too much fun. You're free. You're out of college. You don't live at your mama's house no more. You're out on your own. So what do we do? Mostly all of us, 98% of the people I know, we spend our 20s trying to exert ourselves in the fun category. 
we so that we got to get off work so we can go to happy hour. We got to get off work so we can go get high. We got to get off work so we can go drink a cold. We got to get off work, go smoke one. We got to go hang out with the fella. We got to play video game. The average person blows all of their twins. Then when you find out that life ain't waiting on you, now you're 30. Now guess what happens to mostly all of us, including myself. I spent all of my 30s trying to do the things that I should have been doing in my 20s. So now my life is behind. Now you look up and you're 40s. you in your 40s. And now you're trying to do the things and have the things that you could have had in your 30s, man, had you just done what you should have did in your 30s. And then the tragedy starts to occur. You look up and you're 50. Now, that don't mean it's too late for you, because it wasn't too late for me. But you look up in your 50, and now all of a sudden, all through your 50s, you're trying to create and have a life that you could have created and had in your 30s. My suggestion to all young people, if you could just hear me clearly, don't do what I did. So you look at my life now, and you think, oh, Steve, you got it going on. Man, you don't know how hard I made it on myself taking the route that I took. If I could start over again and, do, and change one thing, I would buckle down in my twins. While you're young and energetic, alleviate some of that BS that you're so dedicated to. The 20s, man, you dedicate to the girls, to dudes the video games, the clubs, the happy hours, that smoke, that drink, that freedom, you so, but in dedicating yourself to that freedom and that fun, man, you lock yourself out of the American dream. And it happens to 98% of the people. And the reason I know it is because it happened to me. And if I could tell anybody, Man, if I could do it again, I would have changed the way I live my 20s. And if I was in my 30s, you really in your 30s, it's time out for clubs and drinking and happy hours and parties. In your 30s, it should just be about the business of your life. Because say what you want to say about me. Uh, every time I hear Steve, man, he's trying to preach to somebody. I'm really just trying to share some valuable information. Because I lived all the messed up sides of it. Flunking out of school, man. Losing everything I ever had. Divorces. I'm telling you, man, I did so many things wrong. I made so many mistakes. Homeless, living in a car. I made incredible mistakes. I could have avoided a lot of those. Now, it created who I am. Now, once you've made the mistakes, just get up, man. Quit, don't wallow in them. Because you can recover from all mistakes. But you got to want to recover. You got to ask for forgiveness. You got to go to all the people that you crossed and you wrong and you let down. You got to say, look, I'm sorry. I made a mistake. Forgive me and move on. Now, everybody ain't going to forgive. That's life. God is in the forgiveness. I see people trip out when I, when I throw God at them. I'm just telling you, man, the reason I throw God out there is because God is available for everybody. I always wanted to be that you. But if you want to be the downright hardcore successful, have a little extra money, you got to get busy. Whatever you're doing right now, as hard as you think you work, you got to quadruple that. And then when you look up and that ain't working, like here's my father always told me. He said, son, when you think you've done all you can do and you can't do no more, do something.
You have got to change the way you think. It is the whole determining factor of where you go in life. We are all where we are today because we thought ourselves to this position. If you don't like the position, think yourself out of it. Your brain is divided into two halves, positive and negative, good and evil. It don't function on nothing else. Ain't no neutral ground in your brain. It's either positive and good or negative and evil. Each half of your brain has millions of factory workers on each side. You got a million factory workers on the positive side. You got a million factory workers on the negative side. At the forefront of each one of those factories in your brain is a foreman. You got forming positive and you got forming negative. You are in charge. You're the boss of the factory. Guess what? We are how we think. You can't make a world, but you can make your own world. So now, since your brain is in two halves, let me show you how this works. You wake up in the morning and you say, man, I don't feel myself today. I got up on the wrong side of the bed. I'm not a morning person. Forming negative. Her hears that. He steps to the front. He said, what did you say? You say, I said I woke up on the wrong side of the bed day. I'm not myself. I'm not a morning person. He says, you got it right away. He said, hey, the boss just woke up and said he's not a morning person. He's having a bad day today and he ain't feeling himself. Let's get to work. The million factory workers start producing thoughts to justify what you just said. So now guess what? Man, I hate my alarm clock went off this morning. I got to get out here in this traffic. I would drive down here to do I don't even like these people on my job. I can't stand this car I'm finna get in this morning. Sure wish I had a new car, but I'm driving this ragged ass car. And on and on and on. And your day starts tumbling into what you ordered at the top of the day. You can wake up in the morning and you say, you know what? Today is gonna be a great day today. I expect something really good to happen for me today. He said, what did you say? You say, I said, I'm having a great day today. I expect something good to happen today. Forming positive turns around and goes, all right, let me have your attention. Steve's having a great day today. He's expecting some wonderful things to happen. And man, let's get it going. And they start manufacturing thoughts. Same brain, man, I can't wait to go to work today. It may not be the job I want, but at least I got a job. I'm so sure grateful I got a car to drive to work today. Hey man, at least I got a check coming in. I appreciate the fact that I don't have a car, but at least I can walk to the train. Man, this is gonna be great today. That's how your mind works 24 seven. It never turns off. Change your attitude, you change your altitude. It all depends on how you look at it. Our lives are mostly affected by the way we think things are. Not the way they are. The way we think they are affects us most. And Shok taught me that the mind is like a factory, a mental factory. And whatever you think about all day long pours ingredients into this mental factory. And that's what builds the economic, social, financial fabric of your life. As you think, so you become. Albert Ice, 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 Albert Ice said once. He said, Imagination is everything. It's the preview to life's coming attractions. I want you to get this now. Imagination is everything. It's the preview to life's coming attractions. Because if you think about it, everything you have, everything we have in this world, somebody imagined it. It's your ma imagination is tremendous. Somebody was sitting on the phone one day talking with a cord to the wall 
and said, man, I wish I could just go outside with this phone. Everybody in here got a cell phone. Somebody imagine that. Somebody got tired of riding in a wagon cross country from slavery to freedom. Somebody said, I wish we had something that made these wheels move by themselves. We drive cars. People got tired of driving from New York to LA. Somebody said, I wish we could fly. We got airplanes. Imagination is everything. It's the preview to life's coming attractions. Your real life, the one God really got for you, is in your imagination. It is not in your current situation or your current paycheck. And if you've been living like that, you have then restricted yourself to a commonality that is really not yours. Because what really God got for you is really in your imagination. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. So when I told you a minute ago, you got to have a tremendous work ethic, but you got to have a lot of faith. I talk to so many people who get older, like some of us are, and they've lost the faith. Well, faith is really simple. It's the, faith is the substance of things hoped for. All that means is in the beginning, you just hope something pop up. You know, you just kind of hope something happened for you. I was hoping I would get on TV. I wrote it on a piece of paper when I was 10. I want to be on TV. The problem I had when I wrote it at 10 was I suffered from a severe stuttering problem. I could not talk outside of my house. So can you imagine when I wrote on a piece of paper, I want to be on TV and turn that in. First thing the little boy next door, next to me asked me, he said, well, how long is your TV show going to be? But when I wrote it on the paper, it wasn't factual. Just hope. You just gotta start with the hope. Faith is the substance of things that you hope for. You just hope something, Joe. Then what happened is through grace and favor, He give you a couple of them things you hope for, and then you're supposed to start believing then. Because now it turns into faith. But if you take this scripture, faith is the substance of things hoped for, and the evidence of things not seen. What is the evidence of things not seen? I just told it to you. Albert Einstein said, imagination is everything. It's the preview to life's coming attraction. But guess what? Your imagination really is. It's the evidence of things not seen. Because your imagination, you know why it's the evidence of things not seen? Because you're the only one who can see it. Your imagination it's actually God showing you a preview of a coming attraction that he has for you. The moment you don't believe in your imagination, you negate what he got for you. Your imagination is the preview to life's coming attraction. It is the evidence of things not seen. Because can't nobody see it with you. Your problem is you keep telling your imagination to the wrong people. See, if you want to kill a big dream, tell it to a small-minded person. It's dead. How many times, man, have you had a tremendous idea? Something you thought was the one, and you went and told it to your loved ones and your so-called friends, and they shot it down. I mean, you was convinced that it was just, oh, man, I just came to you. And you told it to them and they shot it down. And you thought since they was your loved ones and their friends and they got your best interests at heart, you believed them. You was wrong. They taught, You let them talk you out of what God got for you. Some of y'all still sitting here with the ambition of opening a business one day, but you scared to go start the business because you got a job and you got bills. Rich people got bills. Everybody got bills. Hell, I got bills. You, you, who, you, everybody owe somebody something. I got something with the bank right now. You're going to let the fact that you got some bills stop you from opening the business, the thing that God done put in your imagination. So you're going to squash that because you got bills. Everybody got bills. Your real life is in your imagination. Can, can you can you can you grab what I'm telling you? So I don't know what you thought I was gonna say to you. I'm just a real dude. I don't even have the education you all have. I flunked out of school. I flunked. I ain't got no education. I don't use four syllable words. 
The only four syllable word I know is my bank account. What I'm sharing with you is stuff that everybody can apply today. If you're sitting in here thinking that you're too old to listen to what Steve, hell, I'm 60. I'm 60 years old, but I still rely on my imagination. See, if you think you're too old to make it, let me give you a prime example. Colonel Sanders. Colonel Sanders has been frying chicken his whole life. He was telling everybody he had the best chicken in the world. Ain't nobody believe him. They turned him down everywhere. Colonel Sanders didn't get a franchise till he was in his 60s. Kentucky Fried Chicken sell more chicken than anybody in the world today. So if you're sitting there thinking because you got a little gray on you, you're too late. As long as God waking you up in the morning, that's the sign that he ain't through with you. So what you tripping for? You sitting up in here like, like God can't do nothing for you because you 60. Man, you know what I'm asking God for right now? And I'm 60. If you could see my vision board, you would be, you would be blown away. Because I got enough right now. I really know. But I ain't in the need business. I'm in the want business. Ain't nothing wrong with wanting something. Quit going down to these churches y'all sitting up in here going down to. Let, keeping you in these little boxes. God got a big life for you. The only person ain't there. And look, and I love church. Don't get me wrong. I'm not knocking church. Don't you, don't, don't tweet that. Go. Steve don't care for the church no more. I didn't say that. But don't go down there, memorize all these scriptures, and then don't apply none of them to your life. That's what I'm talking about. Quit going down there just to go and just get a couple of scriptures and apply them to you. Let me give you one that's real simple. See, these, are, these principles of success, they've taken all of these scriptures and they're putting them in books and they call them you know, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, The Magic of Thinking Big by David Schwartz. But all these, everything in there is a scripture. They just reworded it because people don't know how to read the Bible. Like, I can't really read the King James Version. I can't. The smallest scripture I ever read changed my life. The scripture real so. You have not because you ask not. Do you know the difference that that could make in your life. I'm just giving you real talk now. I'm just trying to tell you how I got here. See, I, I have no education. I applaud all of you with your education. I've sitting them talking to so many men who have in, in, in corporate American. I, I'm, I'm, I'm in awe of that because I don't have it. But you sit here and you take what you have and it could be so much more if you would ask. See, you have not because you asked not. When the last time you really asked him for something? Or do you keep making requests that's inside the confines of your paycheck? When you gonna get outside of that? Didn't I just tell you God ain't in your paycheck? Didn't I just tell you he ain't in your job title? The life God got for you is in your imagination. Why you still imagine this stuff? Why you keep dreaming of a summer home? Why you keep dreaming of retirement, leaving your grandkids money? So I'm at the age now where I think about my grandkids. I got seven TV shows. Dog, I only need one. One show pay me enough money. I do not live my life in the confines of what anybody says to me. I let my imagination go, and now imagination is a preview to life's coming attraction. But what that really means is, is God showing you a preview of what he has for you. So now, if you have not, cause you ask not, do you understand if you up your ask, he has to up his gift? Just period. This is simple stuff that anybody can apply. You ain't even gotta have no degree to do this. You don't even have to have no money to do this. You can start this today and change your whole game. Because you're going to need grace and favor anyway. You need to dream the faith. And then he put his grace and favor on top of you gone. But you got to ask for something. If you up your ass, he got to up his gear. Period. Listen. I have asked God for some of this. Everything he hasn't given to me. 
is on the way. I have no doubt about it. Why would he not? See, let, can, can I tell you what really prompted this thinking in me? When I was homeless, I lived in a car for three years. I made some decisions in my life, man, that threw myself off. My decision in October, uh, October 8th, 1985, I walked into a comedy club for the first time. Had never heard of a comedy club. All my life, I wanted to be on TV. So I ran up on stage. I'm doing, I don't even know what to do, but I just started talking about boxing and stuff that happened to me. Audience was hollering, laughing. They brought all 10 of us back up on stage. They had a clap off. I won the clap off. I won $50. I cried from Cuyahoga Falls to Cleveland. The girl kept saying, why are you crying? It ain't with $50. I said, no, nah, you don't understand. It's way more than 50 This is what I do. She said, what you mean this is what you do? This is just your first time. You don't understand. Something happened. I won average night. I went to work the next day, October 9th, 1985, and quit my job. You've all seen this book I got out, this video called Jump. Oh, I jumped. Now, I don't recommend that you do it that way, because two years later I was homeless. <laughs> Because the first year of comedy, I made $3,400. The next year, I made $4,800. And the third year, I made $5,300. I got a wife, a set of twins. I'm sending every dollar I got to them. So I tried to live on $50, $75 a week gas for 38 cents a gallon back then. I just stayed in my car. So I lived in my car for three years. Three years, I lived in my car. And what happened was, I just said, man, so I used to fish all the time to eat because I'm a fisherman, I'm a bass fisherman. So I used to stop at lakes and ponds and just fish. And every night, every month, I get run off from somebody's land. Hey, get away from here. Hey, move along, that's not yours. Hey, stop fishing here. I just get run off. And he didn't understand. And one time I had fish on the line. He said, you got fish on that line? I said, yeah, throw them back. I had to throw them back because I used to stop at rest areas with them little cast iron grills. I kept charcoal in my car. I started a fire and I eat fish. There's some days I wouldn't eat. So that they thought I was just fishing, but I was eating. So I said one day, I said, man, you know what? One day, man, I'm going I'm to I'm get myself some land. I'm going to buy myself a piece of dirt. So fast forward, God bless me. I get on TV when I'm 38. I'm on Showtime at the Apollo. Lord, have mercy. They gave me my money. I saved my money up. I saved $250,000. I said, I'm going to give me some land. I went to Texas, and I'm about to buy some land. But before I went to buy the land, I was curious. I just had the thought. I said, man, I wonder how much land is on earth? How, how many acres is on earth? Because you know it's not going to change. You know, God lets you fly. God lets you dive on the water. God don't let you make dirt. Can't make dirt. So I looked it up. It's roughly over, just a little bit over, 36 billion acres of land. 36 billion acres of land. So I just got a little bit more curious. And I said, well, how many people on earth? I looked it up. And it was about 6 billion people on earth. So I did some Steve Harvey thinking. I said, okay, if it's 36 billion acres of land and it's about 6 billion people on earth, everybody ought to have 6 acres of land. Not just me, you know, I just, just think. So I asked God, could I have 6 acres? That's all I wanted. Because you know the one thing I wanted? I didn't care if I put a house on it or nothing. I just wanted to be a stand somewhere and couldn't nobody run me off. You know, man, I was in a world of hurt. I was so sick of just getting, just getting run off, man, every time I stopped. So I got this money, man. I saved my money. I saved $250,000. I'm going and I'm looking for some land. 
the first day I get there, I see a piece of land in Texas, so beautiful, I couldn't believe it. It had rolling hills, had a pond on it where I could fish. I, the dude took me over there, I look at the land, and I'm, and I'm looking out, I said, man, this is great right here. I said, sir, how much is this right here? He said, well, it's about $600,000. I said, man, I ain't, I ain't got that kind of money. He said, well, how much do you have? I said, I got 250000 I said, well, let me think about it, man. He said, let me think about it. And I was standing there, and then I stopped. I said, sir, can I ask you a question, man? How many acres of land is that? He said, this is six acres. Six. Six years ago. I just asked God, just give me six. See, I didn't want a whole lot of acres. I just wanted my cut. Just give me my six. And so I said, ain't this crazy? So I thought about it. I said, man, what can we work out? Right before I got ready to say it, the guy that took me over there said, Steve, let me show you something right quick. He took me over to this hillbilly's house. He took me to his house. He said, let me show you something. It took me over and showed me this land, and it was massive. It had three lakes on it. It had rolling hills. It had trees. It was unbelievable, man. I said, man, this is incredible. I said, man, how much is this? He said, this 16 acres. I said, hey, man, I ain't got that kind of money. Let me go on back over here to this dude where I can, Mike can cut a deal. He said, well, let me ask you something. What was you going to give that man over there? I said, well, I hadn't worked it out yet because all I got is $250,000. He said, well, listen, I'm in a little bit of a tight right now. He said, if you can bring me 250000 cash by tomorrow, i give you this 16 acres. I showed up next day, $250,000. 16 acres see that's grace and favor right there that's what that is so my first piece of land was 250 acres so i said man this is the land that i'm gonna save for my family i'm gonna fish on the rest of my life i'm gonna be an old man so then i got to thinking i said hold up man you mean you have not because you asked now i asked for six six years ago he showed me six but he gave me 16 so i went to god I said, God, listen to this. I'm from Cleveland. I got a couple partners that's locked up. They probably won't be using they six. Now, let me tell you something. I'm so busy now, I don't even get to go to that ranch. I never can go. And I thought I was going to be fishing and save it for my kids the rest of their life. But God had another plan for me. That's the ranch that I have my mentoring camp on. I bring a thousand black boys out there with a thousand single mothers. And that was the purpose of that ranch. I never go there to fish at all. But see, that's what I wanted. I thought that's what it was for. But God got another plan. His way is way bigger than yours. You can't even see his way. But you gotta start to hustle. You gotta give God something to work with. Look, if you start hustling, and grinding, he'll fill it up for you.